So let me sort of uh, quickly review what we are doing. And uh, so primarily I wanted to tell you that uh, electric and magnetic fields we know, we understand them. But um, potentials are less understood. But on the other hand, if you think about it, that um, the, if you talk about, for example, level of water, now the water level is not the same as water itself. So in potential, in some sense, we are talking about a level. So scalar potential, we have all been familiar with. And that's why you never ask a question. You always assume that whatever is being said, MGH is the potential energy, is perfectly correct. You don't always ask, why are you saying it is MGH? Why not MGH plus 10, MG times 10? I could have done that. But is, that is because of certain conventions that people have worked out with respect to the definition of the zero of the potential energy. If you are doing a problem connected with a gravitational field, you would say potential energy of an object when it is at infinite distance is zero. If you are in the same gravitational field, but talking about small distances, what happens to a particle if it is dropped from here? Now, you do not uh, take the zero of the potential energy at infinity. You will say zero of the potential energy is the floor. And even in the books, they will not write it down. That is because this is something which has been taught to us, understood by us from the time we were children. That, well, last time I talked about the a situation where we talked about a potential corresponding to uh, the a linear field, 1 over r. So we said that potential has to be logarithm function. Okay. So what my statement about the scalar potential is applicable to all types of potentials you can think of. The potentials themselves are not important. The potential, why we work with potential, particularly scalar potential, is a very useful thing because it is a scalar and I can add them easily. Vector potential is not that greatly useful for the simple reason that it has the same level of difficulty as directly dealing with magnetic field itself. But the point is, that derived quantities, they are important. This is, as you know, the financial capital of India. So I am sure many of you know what is a derivative. So this derivative is not differentiation in Bombay. In Bombay language, a derivative is a financial instrument where the it gets its value, derives its value from something underlying. Okay. So in some sense. The quantities themselves are not important. But take a vector potential, vector potential itself is not particularly important, but its derivative, its curl is the magnetic field, which is physically important because it can exert a force on a charged particle, which I can actually measure. So this is the issue. And what we said is, though the vector potential seems like something very esoteric, mathematical construct, there are ways in realizing that yes, I can sort of give some sort of physical meaning. And there were lots of discussion because I guess primarily because this is not found in any electrodynamics book. So the thing that I was trying to tell you is that why interference pattern? I was not planning to do it, but because of this question has been raised, I will actually prove in my optics course that two perpendicularly polarized lights do not interfere. You could easily do it by simple mathematics. Now, this is not really part of the normal Young's double slit experiment. But if from the same source you split the two lights and on, on one path of one of the beam, you put a polarizer, on path of the other beam, you put a crossed polarizer, the effect will be to totally get rid of the interference pattern. And the reason is that Polarization is an important thing there. And, and this is, of course, what we are trying to say is that this experiment proves that what the vector potential does is to change the electron wave function's phase. As you know that if the phase itself is changed, it will not change the intensity. Okay? But because we are adding phases in an interference experiment, 
the result will be totally different. I will not go through it again, but we have had a reasonable amount of discussion on this. There is one uh, particular case, we, we calculated in case of solenoid, but another particular case I would like to point out, what is the vector potential corresponding to a constant magnetic field? Supposing I take a magnetic field in the z direction. Now, I have already told you that the question itself is meaningless. What is the vector potential? Because vector potential is not a unique quantity. So, for example, in this case, A is written, for example, as a B cross R by 2. You can sort of take the del cross of that, okay, and show that this is actually the magnetic field. And if you do a divergence of this quantity, it turns out to be 0. Now, divergence equal to 0 is a Coulomb gauge. Here I have given you two equivalent expressions for A, both of which have the same curve. I have told you two functions can have the same derivative, that is not a problem. So this is exactly what has happened here, it is a three dimension. You, you differentiate this, the x component is minus by by 2, y component is plus bx by 2 do a trivial calculation, you will find that the del cross of A happens to be equal to B itself along Z direction. And alternatively, you take just an X component, magnetic field only, magnetic vector potential only in the X direction and its magnitude is minus By. You can calculate the curl again and you will find it happens to be still B and both of them satisfy del dot of A equal to 0. So, and this reason is what is called a gauge choice that we have. And gauge choice comes because of the fact, I am going, because of this gentleman who came from somewhere, I am going to skip the boundary conditions on magnetism because otherwise I will not be able to do it. Fine. So that is all about vector potential, we will come back. Let me then talk about magnetic materials. Remember in the, our discussion of the electrostatics, we pointed out that we have conductors about which we have not talked much because that is something which is very familiar to you and we have dielectrics. Dielectrics is just another name for insulators. And what we said is that what distinguishes a dielectric from a conductor is at microscopic level the availability of free moving charges. Conductors, we have free charges. In insulators or dielectrics, the charges are bound. The negative charge centers are bound to the positive charge centers. But on the other hand, there can be certain amount of separation between these two charge centers so that a small sample can have a dipole moment even though it does not have a charge. We talked at some stage about a quadrupole, a multipole expansion. It is possible to expand things such that it is a collection of dipole moment, quadrupole moment, octopole moment, etc., etc., etc. But we are not going into that. Now, in magnetism, exactly the similar situation. Accepting that, we know that it is steady currents which give rise to magnets. Magnetic phenomena. The source of magnetism is steady current. But however, you have to realize that even inside molecules and atoms, there are internal currents. Right? What is current? Current is basically a moving charge. So even if you take the Bohr model of an atom, the electron is moving around the nucleus and the moving current that gives rise to an internal current or atomic current, etc. Now the question is this. So these atomic currents, if you go to little more detail, it can arise because of the orbital motion of the electrons around the or about the spin motion. Now remember our picture of atoms and molecules are very classical here. We are not worried about 
the fact that some of them may not because I am disc discussing macroscopic system for which classical mechanics is good. So the spin which is a purely quantum mechanical object, spin cannot be explained classically let me be very clear. It is a purely quantum mechanical object we still you know many textbooks will point out that look what is a spin you know it is something like earth rotating about itself that is a spinning motion whereas earth rotating around the sun is an orbital motion. In classical physics this is correct but there is no concept of a spin in classical mechanics. Anyway that is let us not go there because that is not part of my job. So in the presence of the magnetic so I may have like I told you that in the absence of an electric field the molecular dipoles are randomly oriented. As a result the net dipole moment works out to zero. I make exactly the same statement for the magnetized specimen. I start with randomly oriented magnetic moments. It is the same question which people ask that you pick up a piece of iron you all know iron is a magnetic substance but an ordinary piece of iron is not magnetic right its net magnetic moment is zero because what happens in a piece of magnet is there are domains there are small regions in it with the net magnetic moment but at an arbitrary temperature these magnetic moments are aligned haphazardly so that the net magnetic moment that you get is equal to zero such a situation is known as a paramagnet. If you apply a magnetic field, this will try to persuade these domains to align, giving a net magnetic moment. Then of course you are aware of the classification between uh, ferromagnet, paramagnet, etc. I am not going into it. All substances are diamagnetic, whether they are paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, etc. not important. All substances are diamagnetic. Because diamagnetism is a consequence of Faraday's law and it has nothing to do with what material we are talking about. Now when we say some substance is ferromagnetic, it simply means that the magnetic effect there is a lot stronger than the Faraday's law effect. So what we say is this, that what is meant by a current? The current is the source of my magnetic field and this current as we have been talking about can be the macroscopic charge transport that is bulk transport of charge. What happens when you put in a wire connect the wire to a battery. So that is the macroscopic charge transport so that is one part of the current. A second part of the current is lies within it there are these atomic currents and what I look for is an average atomic currents because there are a large number of such currents which have to be added up. So this is my net current density like we define polarization vector as the net dipole moment per unit volume, I define the magnetization vector as net magnetic moment per unit volume of the substance. You notice that everything is parallel. Okay. So let us then ask what about magnetic material? We have of course now learnt about the magnetization vector potential and I did not quite work it out. Supposing you took a current loop, I have already said that a current loop is equivalent to a magnetic moment. You all know this. Now, if you calculated the vector potential corresponding to a current loop, you get an expression like this. In fact, what you do is del cross A if you take, you will find the expression for the magnetic field due to a circular current loop. So th this is what we start with if I have an elementary magnetic moment this is what it will be. So if I have a large number of magnetic moments I would say 
well simply integrate this or sum this same expression and so in this case that the r prime is being integrated which means this is over the substance and r is the point of observation so this is where the magnetic vector potential will be given by an expression like this i am not derived it but let me quickly tell you that it's not a very difficult job what you do is you take a circular current loop which you know is equivalent to a magnetic moment which is equal to the current flowing in times the area and direction is perpendicular to the plane so use that to derive the expression for the vector potential now once you have done that that the a magnetic moment kept at the origin at the position r gives you this vector potential if you have a distributed magnetic moment at the position r prime then the vector potential due to this trivially must be given by this expression okay now just the way we had seen that the polarization gives rise to a volume charge density and a surface density so we had said that del dot of p was something and p dot n was something here it turns out an identical expression is valid now this is the del cross b which was equal to mu zero j we have said j now has two parts a conducting part jc and atomic current density part which is jm and this jm then is given by del cross mr and the surface one is given by n cross mr remember again parallel thing we had minus del dot of p and p dot n okay here there is a reason why the signs are different because of the convention that the direction of the dipole moment is from the negative charge to the positive charge but other than that there is nothing else the derivations are identical and the conclusions are similar now with this let us now take stock of where we stand this stage contains essentially everything that we need to know about the maxwell equation first b dot dl integration was known to be mu zero i this is what we had done by ampere's law so what happens to that we said look i is current so one part is conduction current the another part is the current due to atomic current which i call as the magnetization current so my integral b dot dl is simply modified like this and according to this definition which i had the magnetization current is simply given by del cross m dot ds which is by stokes law is m dot ds now if you bring this this to that side put in i m by this way instead of integral b dot dl being equal to mu zero ic you get some other quantity dot dl equal to mu zero ic so you say that look that what the situation is here is that what is happens to be deciding things is not the magnetic field b remember again we had said in the dielectric situation we needed to change the electric field we said there was a change because of the dielectric we defined a new vector called d vector here what we do is again we define a new vector which is incidentally in many books you will find b is called the magnetic flux density and this divided by mu zero minus the magnetization vector you put it in the equation for the h becomes much simpler which is h dot dl equal to ic you should remember what you did for the electric case we defined there a quantity known as the d field and we said just as e field is caused by all types of charges real or induced or everything if i could switch off or separate somehow the 
real charges from the fictitious charges, the induced charges. Then it is the D field which is determined by the real charges, though in principle there is no way of doing such separation. In actual problem there is no way you can separate them. Now here we say exactly the same thing. We said that supposing I have a problem with the magnetization and what I do is I say alright, some or other mentally I can switch off the magnetization. Then the only current that I have is the conduction current the free charges and the field that is determined by the free charges is this new field H. There is a lot of confusion on the terminology. B is sometimes called magnetic field of induction, H is called magnetic field. In fact, the electrical engineers probably prefer to call H as the magnetic field. Whereas in physics since we always talk about the field B, that has become our standard terminology that B field is the magnetic field. Though in the old days, you will find if you had a old book of Halliday Resnick, yesterday people talked about Halliday Resnick, you will find the magnetic field B was measured in Weber per meter square before the unit Tesla came into the picture. And the nomenclature is the flux per unit area. Okay. So the, this is not something which I will be doing because Professor Suresh will be talking extensively about at least in one lecture about magnetic materials, but if you have linear magnetic material where the magnetization is proportional to this H and you have this expression and paramagnets are characterized by susceptibility becoming greater than zero and diamagnets of course have susceptibility less than zero etc. Et okay, this is what I was supposed to do in the morning.